우리한테는 굉장히 굉장히 진짜 아너 같은 거야. 우리가 고맙게 생각해야 되고 닥터마도 이제 캄프로 본 벨지움. 베이지 벨지움. 브라이트네덜란드 <웃음> 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 그러니까 맨수 쪽에서는 우리가 여기 지금 보여주는 것처럼 이 마이크로 패브리케이션이나 이런 칩이나 이런 거 하는 데 굉장히 선구자적인 분이죠. 근데 이분이 이제 우리한테 그래도 저기 계시는 한국 산업부 조 교수님이 어레인지를 해 주셔서 우리한테는 상당히 좋은 얘기를 들을 거야. 그래서 처음은 제너란 얘기 하시고 지금 이분은 캘리포니아에도 있고 지금 당장은 WCC 프로그램으로 울산 강의대에 와서 3년 계셨고 그러니까 울산 강의대에 재료공학과하고 바이올로지를 바이올로지 파트를 퓨전하는 큰 일을 해주셨어서 우리가 울산 강의대 갔다 온 이혜영 매니저하고 어, 팀장은 봤지만 엄, 엄, 이게 한 40억 50억 정도의 퍼시리티를 가지고 계셔 바이오맨스 쪽에 굉장히 앞으로도 우리랑 굉장히 일을 좀 같이 붙어서 하려고 하고 있고 그 다음에 첫 번째는 제너럴 안 가신다고 그러시는데 무슨 얘기 하실지 모르고 두 번째 세 분은 이분은 지금 당장 캘리포니아 그룹 인디아 그룹 코리아의 유니스트 여러 군데 그 연구 팀을 가지고 계신다 그래서 그 프로젝트를 하나씩 설명해 주실 거고 마지막 섹션은 우리 회사가 지금 굉장히 관심 있는 거니까 칼라 마이크로 박테리아인데 칼라를 반짝반짝 빛을 내는 거를 가지 얘기를 하실 거예요. 그래서 그거는 우리 뭐 다른 데서 오신 분도 계시지만 그래도 오픈해서 얘기하면 그게 우리가 지금 연구소가 굉장히 이 닥터 마도랑 같이 일을 할수 있는 분야가 이제 그거의 어플리케이션에 우리가 좀 하려고 하니까 정신 있게 정찰을 듣고 이제 근데 굉장히 3년 동안 한국 사람들한테 강의하고 울산 강의대는 전부 다 영어로 강의를 하기 때문에 우리들을 굉장히 이렇게 딱 끌고 가실 거야. 네. 조금 못 알아들어도 졸지 말고. 이게 응? 톡할 때는 우리가 배우고 사람들하고 눈을 마주치면서 이렇게 돌아가면서 하라거든. 이렇게 하실 거야. 이때. 플리즈 렛미 인트리뷰스 닥터 마드. It's, it's your time. Okay. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back in my Sobin. Uh, I always want to pronounce it Solin, but you pronounce it like Sorin. <laughs> Sorin. <laughs> yeah, I have a very heavy accent. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of work this morning. Uh, we talk about four different topics, and each of these topics or a research project uh, from my group, uh, either in UC California, e, uh, at Irvine, uh, UNIST, uh, or uh, in India, IIT Kanpur, uh, or perhaps also in Switzerland, EPFL. Uh, over the last 10 years, my group has become very, very international. And mm -hmm. so, uh, it's almost like a new way of thinking People in that country are better at this, people in that country are better at that, and then you try to combine the best of these countries. Uh, so the first topic is my most ambitious and most difficult project. Unfortunately, we have not made too much progress on this one yet. Uh, what we want to do is ultimately, uh, we want to have a smart pill. Uh, we want to have a pill that's implanted subcutaneously and that does respond to signals in the body. So, a simple example, although not the best, would be a diabetic patient. In the case of a diabetic patient, this would be put under his skin. This would have insulin reservoir. It would have some electronics. It would have a biosensor, in that case glucose, and of course a battery. And the idea is that 
if the glucose level changes, you get more or less insulin. They call that responsive drug delivery. And uh, after 12 years, I will tell you how much progress we made. A little bit embarrassing. It is very difficult. But we made some progress. And so that's the first talk uh, we will handle. So I will introduce to you responsive drug delivery. You see here the same cartoon, already a little bit more detailed. Glucose sensor, rechargeable battery, recharging from outside the body, because you don't want to take it out to recharge the battery. Electronics developed at NASA Ames at the time, because I, a lot of the funding for this came from NASA. And then, the drug delivery reservoir. You might think, why NASA? Well, in space, people have the costumes on. They don't want to prick, right? So they want to have it in the body. Uh, after talking a little bit about our ideas on responsive drug delivery, I will tell you one of my hopes for a solution, uh, especially with respect to the sensing. You will see, of all of the challenges in this device, what do you think is the most challenging? The reservoir opening, the sensor, the battery, or the electronics? So think about it. We have these possibilities. Which one is the most difficult? This one, this one, this one, or this? Power. The power has been solved. Because now, many <coughs> companies can charge batteries from outside the body. Yeah? And we do that with a company called Qualion NLA, solved. Electronics, no problem, no problem. So two left. Later. Open and closing the valve or the sensor. Yes. The problem is the sensor. Today, even today, there is not one sensor, a bias sensor, that can survive in the body for more than six days. Oh, man. Think about it. And we believe we have an answer on how to solve that. And then the other topic I will address, even if you solve that, the survival of the bias sensor in the body, uh, you still have the problem with the sensor itself. And how complex is it? That is why I will talk about carbon MEMS, a new type of building sensors. Then I will talk about a very early application. Then become modest again and say, what can I really do today? And that will be an application with uh, a surgeon in UCSF where we built a pH sensor to go in the womb of a pregnant woman to uh, check the pH. Uh, this is a very famous doctor at UCSF that operates on unborn babies that have a defect and they put the baby back. But often the baby dies, and the mother doesn't know, and might still run around for one or two days, and the most indicative factor is the pH. The pH goes down dramatically. And so we developed, as a very, very, very early principle, very naive principle of this, a pH sensor. Huh? So that would be early application and then because each of my segments of my talks will be pretty fast. Now and then I will skip a little bit. Uh, because I want it to be understandable for all of you. And I want to have four nice different segments this morning. I don't want you to get bored. I want you to stay interested. And if I go too deep in a topic, people, ah, I don't know that, I don't know that. Right? So <laughs> forgive me if it will be a little bit superficial. Okay? So, by the way, this concept, we got so much press and uh, covers of magazines because people are fascinated with this. This is a, uh, actually for a country like Korea that wants to get into biology. This would be a very good kind of breakthrough if you could solve this. Uh, so, I will tell you a little bit about the concept of responsive drug delivery. And then the focus will be on the microfabrication of the drug release reservoirs. That means the actuator to open and close these little holes. How do I do that? Right? How do I open and close these holes reliably? 
And because this project is so old, in the beginning, uh, some of you might know that 15 years ago, silicon was the answer for everything. Uh, you might say, oh, I have a cold for silicon. <laughs> Nowadays, people recognize often you have to use other materials. And you will see that originally we chose as the actuator to open these holes, these holes silicon. And actually, there's a famous professor in MIT, you might have heard about, Bob Langer, who actually set up a company around my first concept here on silicon. And you can find that on the internet. But in the meantime, I had switched idea, and I started doing it in polymers. And then I need to talk about the sensor, right? So not talk about battery, uh, not talk about the electronics, but about the key problems opening these little holes and the sensor that tells you when to open the holes. And how are you going to repeat? We would not. You have to... Uh, we do the calculation and it should be able to stay in the body for four months, five months, six months. This is a good question actually. For what do you use that first? Diabetes is very bad because you need too much insulin. But for hormones, for pain, uh, for things that might happen once. Thank you. Yeah. Because, you see, you might want to split this problem. You might want to put the sensor in the body and then the reservoir for drugs there. There's all type of variations depending on the disease. Yeah. So, first, why do we do this? Right? Why responsive drug delivery? This cartoon on the left explains it. Uh, if this is the drug level in your body, and that's the the time. You know if you take a pill today, uh, of course it will start at the level that's too low. You know, that's the best uh, minimum effective level. That's too high. So where do you want to be? You want to be here, right? And our body does that because it's, it's closed loop. But if you take a pill, it's not closed loop, right? So what you have is this. Too little, too much, too little, too much. For a good, uh, correct drug delivery scheme, you want to have closed loops so that you can be, remain nicely at this level. That's ultimately the goal for this pill. That is what we want to achieve. So now we are getting into the technology, right? We're getting closer. Uh, <clears throat> volume, battery, no problem. A commercial company like Qualion is making it already. Uh, we make about from four to five centimeter outside the skin. If the battery is dead, you recharge it. Big problem will be the sensor. And here I'm showing one approach, and I will tell you more about it. The state of the art of biosensors today, glucose sensors, is still enzyme-based or enzyme mediator. You might all know the famous breakthrough by Turner, Tony Turner, so many years ago, that started this wave of new products where you use a mediator for glucose sensing. As you well know, the scheme was glucose plus an enzyme glucose oxidase leads to hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. People were detecting peroxide. What was the problem with that thing? The problem was the enzyme needs oxygen, and it might be oxygen starved, then your glucose sensor doesn't work. What was the big invention of Turner is to use a mediator. That's the state of the art of glucose sensor. If you want to take a challenge on as a company, develop a better glucose sensor. Even today, the best glucose sensor, all it does is trending. The doctor just knows it's going up or goes down. There's no accuracy very little accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so one of the approaches we will explain to you and we've been following is so-called reagentless sensing. What does that mean? It means that uh, you take a protein, for example, glucose binding protein, mm -hmm. and that protein, as you know, will bind only with glucose, very specifically. And when it binds with glucose, that the shape is first like that of the protein, then glucose comes, shape changes. 
you want to detect that change in shape and how you do that is this you put the fluorescent probe there and the fluorescent probe when the molecule grabs the glucose the amount of fluorescence changes and you measure the fluorescence change why is that so much better there is no bond broken or formed you see in an enzyme based glucose sensor the reaction is based on the Gibbs free energy change meaning entropy changes enthalpy changes in this case what is changing only entropy only the shape therefore you have a chance for it living much much longer it's a good approach and but I will tell you like everything never never anything is perfect there's other problems with it that's it's got to be reversible Sorry? Binding, dissociation, it's got to be reversible. Yeah, it has to be reversible. That's the other point, of course. Uh, that's the big difference between kind of enzyme-based systems and immunology. You go from a KB, uh, an association constant of 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 6th, so it's reversible, versus 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 14th, where it's permanent, right? That's the big difference. It also means, of course, selectivity. Uh, and reversibility is closely connected. If you have something that binds in and out very fast, uh, binding constant is lower, it will be reversible, but not so selective. That's an exam question I often ask my students. What's the connection between the binding constant and reversibility? Very important point. Uh, but so we will talk a little bit more about that. I will not talk about this, I promise you, I will not talk about electronics. But let's now focus a little bit on these little holes where the drug has to come out. So way back in 94, uh, I have a patent. Uh, at that time, I was working at Stanford Research Institute. And we did the following. We have a silicon wafer. We'll show you in a moment the details. And inside the wafer, we make cavities like this. Many such cavities. And at the bottom of the cavity, we have a thin metal. A very thin, maybe one micron. And then we apply a potential, and this metal breaks. And the drug comes out. Now, uh, I need to tell you a little side story. So that young people in the audience uh, get some good ideas. So that patent, 94, long time ago, right? Maybe some of you were not born yet, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one day, there's a man on TV by the name of Bob Langer, interviewed by CNN. Mm -hmm. And my student, who's the co-author on the patent, he says, Mark, read USA Today tomorrow. You will be very surprised. And I was surprised, what I do see is this, my patent. And then there's a science paper describing this. So I write a letter to the editor of science. That's not correct. Uh, this is my invention. This is the patent. And here is my textbook. I actually have this picture in the first edition of my book. <laughs> you know what the answer is of the editor? You have to listen very carefully now. A patent and a textbook do not constitute peer-reviewed literature. You know what that means? You could go to the patent library and publish it. <laughs> so I urge you to read as much patents <laughs> as papers, <laughs> or you might get in some strange situations. <laughs> in any event, I have to be honest, I did not think, and today, I still don't think this is the best answer. Because you see, once I open this, it's over, right? It's corroded, I can only do it once. And so I will talk, show you now, in this slide and the next, what we are doing today. We wanted something that could open and close, open and close. And you can see it here already, but I will detail it in a moment. Times pass, right? We switch from silicon to polyimide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what I have here, you see the yellow and the black. 
The yellow is a thin film of gold, and the black is polypyrrole. It's a polymer. And if you apply a potential, don't worry if you don't understand yet, I will detail more. I'm just giving uh, a little bit of an insight beforehand. <coughs> when you apply a potential, this layer, the black layer will swell, the gold will not. That means it's like a bilayer. This thing will go up and down, up and down. So let me see if the movie works, because in the movie, you see these things? This is this flap. And I will put the potential, and you should see them go up and down, up and down. So, advantage, reversible, number one. Number two, if you calculate the power, there's less power needed for this than for that. So now let me see how I can make the movie work. I think I need to use the mouse, that's what I was told, right? Yeah, it seems weak. There we go. Now, it's electrochemistry and it means it's slow. People that come from the electrical engineering world, they're always disappointed when they see electrochemistry because electrochemistry by nature is slow uh, because you have this big capacitance of the double layer, which is like 40 microfarads. And as you know, if you have a capacitor on any system that's 40 microfarads and you, you calculate tau, the time constant, <laughs> but, but this is fast enough. Yeah. This is definitely fast enough. So let's detail this thinking now a little bit more. So you know kind of what we are trying to do, right? And so I want to tell you about the status of this and then the status of this uh, to tell you how difficult it is. <laughs> uh, so first, the silicon approach. So this is even earlier pattern. You will see how old I am. This pattern is from 1989. So one of my first patterns at the Stanford Research Institute. We uh, found a technique to make a silicon cup. And then at the bottom, this thing here is one micron or less. And as I told you, we can break it electrochemically. So now, I think maybe there's some MEMS people in the group. How many people have done microfabrication in the group? Huh? Two? Three? Good. So I will tell you how we made this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the process. It's so simple, but kind of elegant. So you think with me, right? Uh, I have a silicon wafer. I use KUH, anisotropic etching. As you know, silicon is an anisotropic material. It's a single crystal. And certain directions, this one, the 100, etches very fast. These directions don't etch fast at all. That means if you align a mask correctly on silicon and put this whole wafer with not <coughs> one, but 10,000 of these cups, out comes a wafer with 10,000 little cups, like that. Next step. I oxidize the wafer all around. So I have a layer of, put it down, layer one micron of oxide. Okay. Next, I etch again. Now I come from the back. KOH etches silicon, but not silicon dioxide. That means it will stop here. Right? Because you remember, I have oxide there. So now, if I look through that wafer, you can actually see through it. I have these thin, thin pellicles of silicon dioxide. What I do next is this. Any metal I want, I put from the back. Silver, black, and gold. And now, I etch the oxide away from the top, and voila. I have my electrode. This is the method to make very small electrochemical cells with the electrodes at the bottom. Okay. And you, see, you know why that's so good? Normally, you look people making biosensors. They put electrodes flat and on the top. That's so bad. Because liquid and electronics, they don't like each other. You should put the chemistry here, you can put the electronics on the other side. Okay. So this was a very generic principle we developed for sensor fabrication, but then we recognize quite often this thing broke 
And so I said, ah, if it breaks, we can use it for a valve mechanism. And that is the uh, technology that uh, Bob Langer from MIT Limited mimicked. <laughs> it's a tough world out there. Okay, I told you I switched. I did want something reversible. And so what we did is we uh, have this gold <coughs> film and then we have polypyrrole. If you put the voltage like one volt on this with the step two counter electrode, yeah. Yeah, what will happen? The PPY oxidizes and it swells because counter ions and solvent come in, but the gold cannot swell. So that means you have a bilayer. The only thing you can do is this. And so you can go back and forth between these two stages. And of course, in the blood, uh, you have enough ions to do that, to move up and down. And polypyrrole has been proven it can be used in the body. It actually has been used uh, for uh, stents. So you're okay there. So now, how do we make it? As I promised you, now and then I have to skip a little bit because I want to give short segments uh, of talks. Uh, here, I will have to say, okay, I hope you trust me. <laughs> this is how we make it. So uh, we have silicon, silicon dioxide. You see that's the gold. The black is polypyrrole, which you polymerize it on it. And then here, we have now put this thing on a chamber. You close it off, you put your drug here, and then this thing can go up and down. Yeah? So I'm sorry I will not go into the details of the processes. But I will put this uh, talk on uh, YouTube. You will see the video, and you will also be able to download. And then you can study it in more detail. Okay. So, because I need to make some progress. Uh, this you already know a little bit, right? So. These are the same uh, structures you saw a moment ago. Over here, this is in a beaker, and this is one of these flaps, but in this case we have a little bit different shape, round. And you will see, I will uh, put a potential on it, and you will see a die coming out. You have to have good eyes. <laughs> so this, do you see it? It's just a, and boom. Did, can you see that? Yeah. Right. So that is what you want. Yeah. Now, I will make a big step in my thinking now. Mm. I, you see, I know. Okay, I will try to explain what was there. <laughs> You know now I can put some drug yeah. and open it. So what we are doing here, we are putting these arrays of little cups in a beaker and we put for example blue color dye, red color dye and green. Yeah. And then we measure the absorbance. Because what we want to do is administer regimes of drug delivery. So the doctor can program the chip and say this patient needs this drug. And then this one, then this one, over an amount of time. And that's what we are trying to prove here, that we can uh, control the drug delivery rate. And this has been published, you can find this. So in this case, each drug chamber was filled with a slight <coughs> liter of food dye, blue, red and green. And you see the absorbance appear once this flap opens. And then various drug doses and time sequences can be employed. As you know, for the doctor to uh, make the drug regime specific to a certain patient, that's very important, right? Because different patients might need uh, different drug regimes. Now what I will do is switch back to the idea of sensors. Because we kind of think maybe this is not the biggest problem, drug delivery. But what is the biggest problem with sensors? Even glucose sensors, if you would have to look at the li sorry, literature, you will probably find that David Guff at UC San Diego was the man that succeeded in the longest living glucose sensor in a dog. I think he did about one month. And what he does is he puts it under the skin and then he has a septum 
and so he can now and then renew the enzyme. Mm. That's kind of not cheating, but uh, you would want to do this differently. So now I will show you our idea on how to do it differently. And it's actually very simple. Well, it's simple, it's easy to say, <laughs> we don't know how good it will work in practice. So what we do is this. We use the same cup normally, we put the uh, drug in there, right? Mm -hmm. So why not put a sensor there? Because if I put a sensor there, <coughs> say I make 10,000 sensors, this one breaks, I go to this one, I go to this one, I go to this one. Mm -hmm. So it's such a simple thought, let's say, to make an in vivo sensor, you live with the fact they cannot survive very long. But since I can make so many of them, I will have an array of maybe 100 drug reservoirs, and I will have 10 sensors. Now, what we are facing in the lab, to be honest, is now this. You can only do that if your sensors are absolutely identical. Because suppose this one measures glucose, and it says, you know, there's uh, 26 milligrams per deciliter, and the sensors start fading, and I switch to this one, and they are not exactly identical, I will be at another point. And so, uh, my student, in this case it's a Vietnamese student, Vinh Vo, uh, he's actually now buying commercial sensors, the best commercial sensors, and trying to put them in this protected arrangement. So this is, you will actually often find if you do biosensor research, in the research community you're limited, because often you want to prove very small CVs, some very small variants, but your manufacturing technique does not allow you. Right? Because in a research setting you make 10 sensors, they're all different. And so you have to work with industry to get you know, good reproducibility, and then you could put them in this kind of arrangement. And so that, that's kind of what we are struggling with. Now, so we protect backup sensors until they are needed, uh, sense array for long-term implantable application and integration of biosensing and drug release sensors. And now a little bit further. I told you that our approach to uh, new uh, biosensing, glucose sensing, uh, is this glucose binding protein, right? And it's based on fluorescence. Now, in your life in biosensors, so often you will face this dilemma. Will you use an optical technique or an electric? And even today, after so many years, I still struggle with giving the right answer to that. You know, electrochemical sensors are, in many respects, much less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, they can also work in liquids that are turbid, that are ugly, whereas with optical, you have to have a clear solution. Right? And so, you actually, in general, come to this conclusion. For big, large molecules, let's say for antigen, antibody, DNA, etc., optical might be better. For small molecules that can diffuse fast, uh, you will find often that electrochemical is better. And so because of the difficulty accommodating in one of these cups, because I would need an LED, right? I would need the whole way to do fluorescent detection. So that's difficult. So can I make a better approach, can I make a better sense approach? And this is where my new uh, approach comes in about carbon MEMS. So I will skip this. These are results on glucose binding protein on fiber optic. It works, but it has its difficulties. And for people that have an interest in that, I could actually separately discuss what are the remaining problems if you use glucose binding protein on a fiber optic with fluorescence. Okay. Instead, I want to show my alternative approach to that. But I told you, I have four talks this morning, and I need to limit a little bit. And so I hope you write your questions down, and we have future opportunities to discuss in more detail. So I will skip all of that. And I come to this carbon MEMS. And don't despair if you do not understand everything that I'm saying here, because I have a, a talk this morning that will explain this process better. I think we have come up with 
a new way of thinking about MEMS and nanotechnology. It used to be everything is silicon. Turns out that carbon is becoming a better and better candidate. And it's kind of interesting, right? Because nature also has decided that carbon is a better building block than silicon. And actually, if you look around, we're already talking about carbon nanotubes, we're talking about OLEDs. It's almost like mankind also is coming more and more to that conclusion. And so, about, uh, I was at UC Berkeley, and it was about 90, 94, 95, we came up with a new process called carbon maps. And what it is, is the following. You know, carbon, just like in your pencil, is a very difficult material to machine because it's brittle. So it's difficult to make something. On the other hand, carbon is everywhere. It's in your cell phones, almost all glucose sensors or carbon electrodes, and it's difficult to make it. It's difficult to machine it. And if you use different carbon sources, every time they act differently. Because sometimes maybe you buy carbon and it comes from a beach of coconut shells in Thailand. Next time it comes from another source. And the carbon acts differently. And so we have found a solution to do this very differently. We take a photoresist. We pattern it, any pattern. Here put UCI biomems. But this could be a picture of the uh, face of your grandma. It doesn't matter, right? I put it here in photoresist, and then I do pyrolysis. What is pyrolysis? You put this at high temperature in a furnace without oxygen. And then what happens for the right polymers, not all polymers, polymer loses hydrogen, sulfur, nitrogen, and it shrinks and it shrinks and it becomes carbon. So anything I design in a polymer, I can make in carbon, but smaller. So now, thinking back about so many people have made all type of applications with carbon devices, and it was so difficult to make them. And so, here you see the applications that today, a decade later, this simple insight has led to. Uh, one of my students has started a company, you can look on the internet, Innovate, actually, the chief technology officer is Benjamin Park. My best student ever, mm. Korean student. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the CTO of a company called Innovate. You can check. Makes a non lithium ion battery that has 30% higher capacity today than any battery, including LG. <laughs> uh, very promising technique. We are also at UNIST, we are making the smallest possible. Uh, sensor to probe inside the biological cell. Because what's the big deal? Normally, when you make an electrochemical sensor, you need to put platinum, gold. It's complicated, many steps. You know all I need to do? I put a photoresist and I pyrolyze it out of my sensor. So these are interdigitated electrodes. We make supercapacitors out of it. Uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Jan Schoes at Yale, we're using it for molds for amorphous metal. We've done dielectrophoresis on it. Electrophoresis, we, we made carbon transistors based on it. Uh, I, right now at UNIS, my most exciting project is we make suspended nanowires in carbon. New alternative approach to carbon nanotubes. And uh, we actually built bipolar plates for fuel cells of it. So this field, in such a short amount of time, suddenly all of these applications have come about. And it's really because we found a better way to come to carbon. We didn't need to pattern the carbon, we needed to pattern the polymer instead. Uh, maybe the most interesting one uh, is coming back to this. You see these interdigitated electrodes? What we do with this is the following, you might have heard about this, it's called redox amplification. Instead of one working electrode, so here is the same interdigitated structure you saw, I have two working electrodes. 
and I have a counter electrode and a reference electrode. What happens when you apply a potential on one set of these electrodes? So you see two different colors, right? So one corresponds to one working electrode, the other color is the other working electrode. If you have a small different bias between these two working electrodes, something very cute happens. If a redox species gets oxidized here, it gets re reduced on the other one before it can diffuse out. They call that redox amplification. What that means is if you have a small current of one milliamp, what, what, one nanowire, right? And you then switch on the other electrode, you can amplify your current up to 100 times. You will find a paper with Professor Chin at Eunice and myself on this in Electrochemical Society where we prove an amplification of a factor of 45. And again, by carbon, this is much, much more difficult to make with platinum, and it's cheaper. And just to kind of give you the power, so this is what I want to use for my glucose sensing instead of the optics approach. Right? Number one, the redox amplification. Number two, the sensor will be very small, right? So I need to find a way to have a big surface area. A big surface area in a small amount of real estate and how I do that is by building, I will skip this, by building something like this. You see what I've done? I grew hair on the coast to create a much bigger surface area. So that on the same amount of real estate, I have higher current. And so these are my two new techniques to possibly achieve a better approach to glucose sensing, redox amplification, and maximize the surface area. So that brings us almost to the end of my very first segment, my first talk. So what is the reality of us scientists always trying to come up with the newest breakthrough, new research? But we have to have uh, a community around us that believes us, that starts seeing fruits of our work. And so uh, we have developed a telemetric pH sensor with the fetal treatment center at UCSF, and that was together with uh, my good friend John Hines at NASA Ames. So as I told you, uh, there's actually doctors that uh, do operate on a fetus. Of course, you can imagine uh, this is a very delicate situation because uh, this is usually a child that would be aborted, that's lost. And the mother and father have to sign off their rights uh, for this procedure to happen. Therefore, the rules about using novel technology are a little bit relaxed, right? Because they know it's everything or nothing. And so in this case, uh, we were developing a very simple early idea of this, where all we do is no drug delivery you know, just sensing pH and telemetrically sending the signal out. So that if the baby does, sorry, if the fetus does die, the pH might change by as much as one pH unit, that's a lot. And then telemetrically it would be signaled out. Actually you see, it was the pH probe and then it was put onto a telemetric unit. These are all kind of next versions I'm dreaming of to develop and maybe we find partners to do this. Uh, we do not need to do immediately this drug delivery. There's so many intermediate stages. I mean, as you know, in Israel, there's a country that has a pill with a camera in it. So we need to slowly build on that and make it more and more sophisticated. Maybe next is pill with the pH sensor, pill with uh, a sensor and delivery outside the body and on and on. on. So conclusions, I uh, introduced to you a novel activation mechanism for drug delivery. Uh, I told you about the new approach to in vivo sensing, right? It means, okay, if this sensor is broken, forget it, go to the next one, go to the next one, right? By this protected uh, sensor idea. And then carbon MEMS, it's suggested, might make for many new type of bias sensors through redox amplification, and through high current miniature glucose sensors. 
that are less expensive and more sensitive. So that is my first talk. Maybe we can accept the camera <laughs> and have some questions, perhaps. How many? So you need you need some protein which gives some structural confirmation or change after binding, right. whatever you understand. Right. But the confirmation change gotta be big enough, or you have to modify to emit uh, fluorescence. Yeah. So how mean, many proteins there are? I mean, it's not easy to make them to find out in vivo. Right, and what I need there is actually a reliable partner that does protein engineering, uh, that knows crystal structure of protein, yeah. and knows uh, what happens with the uh, binding site, because the binding site cannot block, uh, be blocked by the fluorescent protein. So you guys need a protein motif guys, then some guys to generate to some fluorescent structure in the molecules to make a right. Right. So, so, in a way, yeah. my team has always worked with uh, protein people, DNA people, and re-engineer solutions with them. You cannot reinvent the wheel. You know, to any, any other questions? <웃음> 자 우리 한 시간 쉬기 전에 우리 닥터 마도가 또 요것도 그 유니스터 그 과기대하고 그 월드 컬리지 그 프로그램에 리포트 되는 거니까 나와서 사진 한방 받고 잘 어? 여기 서서 한 자, 사진 한 장씩 박자 그리고 한 10분 브레이크하고 